Let's learn They're Red Hot by Robert Johnson. Hi everybody, it's Martin from the Washboard Resonators. We're going to learn They're Red Hot by Robert Johnson, a very interesting and weird song of his. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, I think first of all, I'd like to just um, play a, a verse uh, to show you how it should sound. And then what I'd like to do is show you the very basic guitar patterns once we've got those, I'd like to show you a few little variations, including taking like more instrumental passages in the song. I might even share a little bit of history about the song as well. Um, so let's get started. So before we start, it's just nice to say that here I have a Gibson L1 guitar from 1929. This is the exact same guitar that you see in the famous Hooks Brothers picture, uh, where he's wearing the suit. I do believe that was his guitar. You can tell it's the same model it, because it doesn't have the binding. And um, I believe that when he got to um, Texas to do his first recording session, he travelled with this guitar and it was smashed over his head by the police when they raided a, uh, a gambling joint. Um, so, in many ways, a perfect Robert Johnson guitar. Okay then, so I'll just do an intro and a verse, so you've got a reference within this video uh, for what it should sound like and then we'll do the lesson, okay? <laughs> Okay, I've moved a little bit closer so we can see the guitar fretboard and um, the song plays out the key of C and it's quite unusual for Robert Johnson. I'll do a little bit of um, history of the song later at the end of the video in case you're interested. But um, I was requested to do this because I did a video how to play ragtime guitar and I just very briefly used this song as an example within that video. I was really doing a Blind Blake song and a Blind Boy Fuller song in that video. Um, so we're going to play out the key of C. Now let's just look at the intro first. The first thing to think about is that I actually play the intro slightly differently from how Robert Johnson does it. That's because on the original, Robert Johnson plays the intro and it's kind of technically out of time. There's one bar where there's like an extra beat before he starts the song. So you could argue that he plays one bar of 1-4 time instead of usual 4-4 four, four time, or he plays one bar of 5-4. So I kind of straightened it. So when I play with one of my bands, um, I can get, um, the band can come in in time. That's the first move. Now, what is that? this shape here at fret 8. What is that? Think about a bar chord. Then imagine that you simplify that bar chord. We all know that shape. Then imagine you take that finger off. So now you've just got the top three strings. So it's a C chord. Then he plays this shape. It's so a bar at fret 7 across the four strings, and then this finger on uh, fret 8 on the first string. So, what's this shape? You might know this shape from previous videos. Um, basically, that is technically a D7 chord. And you can always tell this shape, because if you just put your finger four frets up on the first string from where that bar is. Whatever note it lands on is the major chord. So we know that's a D because that's an E, just D sharp, D. That's a D major. When we take our finger off, it becomes a D7. So uh, you might think of that sometimes, people talk about long A, so you can play an A like this. Sometimes people just bar it, but they don't play the top string. But then if you do that, that lot in a lot of blues music, like Robert Johnson songs. So if you know the long A, you just slide it up to it becomes a D, turn to D7. Okay, so we've got 
that high C, D7, and this shape, what shape is that? If you know a D7, you're going to slide this up, so these two fingers are on fret 7 again, that is a G7 chord. Again, if you're ever unsure about it, you make the 7 shape and then you put that finger there, and whichever note that lands on, that is the root of the chord. So that is, you see the octave, there's that note, to G. So that's how you find which chord you're on. But I don't play it like that, I just play it like that. Also, yeah, I'm pretty sure Robert Johnson played primarily with a thumb pick and fingers. Now you can, of course, do this with your fingers, with a thumb pick, with a plectrum, you know, or just bare fingers. Um, okay, so we've got, to put this into order, then we hit a regular C chord, and the way I play it is like this. And start the song. So what do we do at the bottom end there? Hit the C chord. Then what I do is I play an F chord. So you think of an F chord, but a lot of time in blues we don't play it fully, we just play this, just almost like a C, C shape, but you're just moving these two fingers nearer to the floor. Oops. And I kind of syncopate them. I, I do and beat them. Push the and. and. Then play a big G7. So you think of a G chord. It's a normal G chord. And then you play with this finger here to get that G7. So to put that into order... get to that in a second. So let me just count that out for you. I think what Robert Johnson does on the recording is he does something, I might mess this up now because I did work it out properly um, a long time ago and then I realised that it was causing problems with, with one of my bands so I, I kind of straightened it out. It was the drummer that pointed it out and we put the record on before a wedding gig once and he was like, he's out of he, he, he's out of the beat or you know, whatever it was. So I think Robert Johnson does this. like he, he dances around a little bit what I do is I straighten it I'm going to count through it so you can hear that what what the actual um, how it works so we're going to go one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four one which is going to be the start of the verse chords two three four one two three four one two So that's like a slightly neat and straightened version. Um, next up, let's look at the verse. So the verse sounds something like this. Okay, so what's that? On the uh, ragtime guitar lesson video that I did, I show how on a lot of these ragtime songs, like the Blind Boy Fuller song, There's a lot of this, this stuff going on, and ragtime music is based on piano music. So there's a lot of emphasis on a left hand bass pattern. Where, and then there's this thing that the right hand would be doing, which bounces in between and off of it, which is syncopated. So there's a lot of standard ragtime guitar and piano patterns that are based within this song. What's really interesting about this song is he doesn't use the... Blake and Blind Boy Fuller moves down this end of the neck. He transfers it up the neck and just does them in this really nice, this really nice rhythm. So again, like we did the D, remember we did the D, we showed you how to make a D major to make it a D7 on the intro. Okay, well, the song is basically going to go C, it's going to pass down to a kind of Normally it would be like an A7, to a D7, to a G7, to a C. And that is a very typical ragtime progression. C, A7, D7, G7, C. 
okay? Um, if you're into the number system, the, the, the Nashville number system, it's a one to a six to a um, two to a five to a one chord. So we're gonna make, what we're going to do is we're gonna put our finger on that C note that's on the top string, which is fret A. We're gonna do that bar. And what Robert Johnson does, he kind of just plays, you know, really off of that fourth string. And then he kind of snaps through to get, give it kind of like a backbeat. So it's quite a simple strumming pattern, but it's, his feel obviously is incredible. And his vocals are incredible. We'll talk about Robert Johnson's vocals shortly. So you've got that C. Then you're going to move it down. One fret. down so you now your little fingers now in the air and you're gonna play as a major then turn it to an a7 then you're gonna play a G and no, a D7 G7 now I simplify it. I don't play it like this because I don't need it I just put the G in so I just play it put the thumb over obviously you can do it different ways it's up to you but I do it I find that a really efficient way of doing it. Now I'm wanting to like do a little up pick on that A7. I don't think Robert Johnson does that, but that's probably just my habit of playing this song for a long time. Okay, so you play that twice. So this song has what's called an A, A, B, A form. Now a lot of old songs from the 1910s, 20s, 30s and 40s often ha have this A, A, B, A form. So um, A, A and then the, 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 the third A, it has the same form. The B often, um, I think it sometimes as a bridge, it has a bridge section and then it does the, the A or the verse again. So. We've now got a lot of this, the basic guitar patterns there. Let's look at the B section. The way Robert Johnson does it is he goes, he plays a, a normal C chord down the low end. I got the girl, she's long and tall. And then he hits the um, C, makes it a C7 by just putting his finger on. Um, string three, um, fret three. Then he plays an F. That more simplified F that I was showing you earlier. Then he hits that again. Then he makes it an F minor. And the way you make it an F minor is any minor chord has a flattened third. So the third is on this this note here, this 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 finger. We want to just make this note this note. And the way you do that is you just bar these two fingers. And that is, I don't know if you can see that, I'm trying to make it so you can see, but um, it's an F minor chord. So, so that should sound something like, something like this. Whoa, whoa. Ah, you can tell I've got a bit of a sore throat. I've done a load of gigs. It's Monday today and I've done a load of gigs at the weekend and I'm a bit, ah, a bit hoarse. Um, I got a girl, she's long and tall. She sleeps in the kitchen with the feet in the hall. Okay. Long and tall, she sleeps in the kitchen with the feet in the hall. Hot tamales and red hot, yeah, now she's got them for sale. And there's a little what's called a tag on the end where you just repeat the D7 to the G7 to the C. Yeah, now she's got them for sale. Yeah, now she's got them for sale. And you start the process again. Hot tub, and then, um. There we go. So basically, you've now got everything to be able to play the song pretty much in the Robert Johnson kind of vein. Now, let's next just look at a few variations. I'll give you a little bit of song history. But just before we do that, do help me and Jack, the Washboard Resonators, in return. Like, subscribe, comment, 
go to the description below, join the mailing list and all the other kind of stuff. So let's now look at a few variations. Now, one of the very first things I want to kind of point out here is I used, I kind of learnt this song and started doing it and I was kind of on geeks playing this song thinking, oh, it's, I'm, not, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to stop playing this song, I'm not feeling it. And I went back and listened to the Robert Johnson version and what I'd missed between listening to it, maybe not listening to it for a while and then doing the song is that Robert Johnson changes the vocals in every single verse. And it's really interesting, and that might be something you want to think about if you are going to be singing this song or somebody's going to be singing it. The first thing he does is he varies the melody quite a lot. So in the first verse, he sings off the C and the E note. Hot tamales and red hot, yeah, she got them for sale. When he comes in on the second verse, he goes up um, and sings, starts with E. Hot tamales and red hot, yeah, now she's got them for sale. And he, and he goes right down the scale and finishes low. And then the third verse, he puts these little asides in. So he sings the, low, the lower melody off the C to the E. Hot tamales and red hot. Yeah, she got for sale. The two hot boy. And he puts all these kind of things in. And then he does another one with me and my baby. And I think he copied Charlie Patton. I think that he listened to a lot of great Charlie Patton songs, Pony Blues and things. And he sings as if, as if he's two or three different characters. He'll say, well, baby, I know what I'm going to. Listen to me, a man from Yorkshire in England, trying to do an American accent. It's terrible. I, if you're watching this in other countries, especially America, you probably feel the same as when American people try and do a British and especially a Northern British accent back at me. It's kind of excruciating. But anyway, let's move on. He kind of does this, Robert Johnson does this thing where he goes, um, uh, uh, long weekend. Somehow, Charlie Patton does this thing where he goes, um, hey baby, well I know what I'm going to do. And he does these other kind of different voices, almost like a kind of... Um, high throaty thing. Robert Johnson does the same thing. Me and my baby, but there's one he's singing about um The Bumblebee got in the Bumblebee mess and ever since then he can't take his rest. He puts this, I mean that's a ridiculous version of it, but it really varies the singing um, and it makes the song really interesting because the guitar pattern basically Robert Johnson never never varies the guitar pattern and that's what makes it interesting and that's what I realised. Um I was missing, so I went back and worked on the um, the vocal melodies that he was doing and and, and tried to, to, to embody them. So that then when I go on the gig now, I can just, I don't copy what he does, I just, oh, I'll sing this next verse high, I'll put some morosides in, you know, so I kind of play with it, but I'm aware of the varying in the different voices. So anyway, that is um, one way to kind of arrange the song and make it interesting. The other thing I find works sometimes really quite well is live is I'll I'll do the first AA of the AABA form so second one so I'm playing up the neck then you do the, uh, the B or the bridge I just played that wrong but that is a variation coming later why do that I play the next A the last A in the in the in the sequence So it actually sets up, builds up a little bit more intensity. So it, it sounds a bit lower and a bit more kind of um, throaty at the bottom end. And then you build up. So yeah, I'll do it like a syncopated strum. And start the next verse with um, that. So that might give you a few ideas. The other thing I do sometimes is I kind of vary um, some and do some instrumentals in it. So with the washboard resonators, we use kazoos as a sort of trumpet sound. So sometimes what I might do, or, or with Lead City Stompers, is, you know, you're basically scatting, but with a kazoo, a kazoo trumpet. So, you know, that's something you could do to make it a bit more interesting. And then what I might do then is, is give the B part to another musician. So it might, could, could be bass. So these are nice little ways to vary it. The other thing you can do is do it as a guitar part. So you can just play the guitar part. Well, or sometimes what I do, if I'm, if I'm doing it like a guitar solo, sometimes what I do then is I, instead of that Robert Johnson strum, 
sort of finger pick it a bit more. And then if you look at that ragtime video, I'll show these licks in there, but you get the B section. That's like a little C blues lick. Then you then when it goes to a C7. explain the chords clearly enough in the B section, but this, the B section is simply this. C, C7, F major, F minor. So what you're trying to do when you, if you play that as a guitar is... So that's me walking it down from a C7 to a... To a C7. A few little bluesy bends, which is very much like a blind, blind Blake trick where you just put your... Um, second string, third fret, and bend it up from a, from a, an F chord. And what I like to do sometimes when I do that F minor is do a diminished shape, which is, I mean, I won't even tell you the the, 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 the the numbers. You can see that I'm sure. You're basically making like a D major shape, but you're moving it up and then putting your little finger down. And you just go up four frets. And you, you start the process again. So there's a few little ideas for doing um, instrumental passages, for arranging the song, and how to um, perhaps do a few little variations and, uh, and you know, play the instrumentals. Um, to finish it, there's loads of ways to end it, obviously, it's, that's down to you to end it. But, um, you know, I think what I like to do is... Um, I do what's called a three tag. Yes, now she's gone for sale. Yes, now she's gone for sale. And I use the bridge chords again. I usually get the washboard to uh, fill in at the end there, but you could do that with yourself. Kind of thing. So there we go. Hopefully there are some ideas there uh, which might help. Um, as I said before, there's a really great book called Up Jumped the Devil and it's um, it's got a really interesting story about this song. I always used to think that, you know, this song stood out from all Robert Johnson's songs because it's more in the hokum vein, which is, which is a very popular genre in the 1930s, because of people like Tampa Red that did these slightly risque comedy jazz and blues songs. Um, there's a story in there where there was a piano player who must have been interviewed in the 1960s or 70s, who was around when Robert Johnson was recording in um, San Antonio. And he says, when he was interviewed later in life in the 60s or 70s, he said he remembers being with Robert Johnson going out to get lunch one day and down towards the Alamo and there was a Mexican lady selling these tamales and I've had tamales once uh, in Mississippi in 2006 and they're like greasy beefy sausages with this it's almost like polenta this like doughy stuff um, very greasy very heavy you know so I always think about that when I sing this song I think about being Bill Street in 2006. But um, apparently, yeah, uh, this lady was selling these and Robert Johnson was like walking back to the studio singing, ah, she's on the sale and making up silly little songs. And I think because Robert Johnson was um, paid by the side, by the record company, he just must have gone back to the studio and just put his silly little song to some really straightforward little, you know, kind of, ragtimey hokum song, you know, things. Apparently he used to carry a little book with a pencil, so he might have just written the words down, put it in front of him on a, t on a chair or a table, and just knocked another song out um, for the session. Uh, I don't think Robert Johnson was precious, because um, a lot of pe artists like him back in the 30s, they were paid by the side, and then those sides were just turned into records for very small, cheap labels that just specialised in jukeboxes. So those songs would go into jukeboxes, and they'd only stay in a jukebox for probably four or five weeks, and then they'd just literally get thrown into trash, and then um, new songs would come on the jukeboxes. And 
uh, that was the business that I think Robert Johnson was in at the time, was just churning songs out that weren't really meant to have a life. Um, so if I could come up with another song, then that's it. So I think, you know, I sort of, to a degree, um, I don't know the sources of who that guy was and if he was really there, but it's, a, it, you know, it's credible and it's possible. I know that book is excellently researched. And it might explain why Robert Johnson's got this bizarre, bizarre, weird little song that isn't like his normal Delta Blues or Sunhouse based or Scrapper Blackwell based, based kind of stuff or Lonnie Johnson based stuff. It's completely standalone and does feel like a knockoff. So maybe that makes sense. So what I'm going to do now is say, um, there will be a load of Robert Johnson videos coming from us. Um, I'll put the links below when they're av available. I'll be doing videos about all his guitars, his girlfriends, his life, places that are still standing that he used to use, buildings and things. Uh, it's gonna be a big series. I just haven't got around to filming it yet. So keep an eye out and um, thank you for watching. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>